Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we're thankful for your Holy Spirit coming to be with us today. We want to hear your voice. I ask you help that my voice would be a voice for you. I ask that all of us would be able to find our voice to speak for you. And bless us this morning in Jesus' name. So I thought about telling my story this morning, as others have done in such beautiful ways. And I have been blessed by those telling of stories during this Voices series. I have been inspired by them as I hear how God is working in so many people's lives in so many different ways. Uh, my story, I have a story, as do you. My story is, to be honest, uh, sometimes challenging and difficult, as many of yours are as well. But also my life is full of uh, God's blessings, and I'm happy to be able to tell about those story pieces. My father died of lung cancer when I was a sophomore in college at Southern. My mother-in-law died of cancer when Shri and I had been married only a little more than a year and a half or so uh, when we were at the seminary. I was diagnosed at the age of 30 with Hodgkin's lymphoma and I went through about a year of chemo and radiation and God blessed with a tremendous and full recovery. A little more recently, due to a genetic condition in my kidneys, um, I was forced to start dialysis a little more than a year ago, last April, a year ago. And fortunately, a miracle of an anonymous donor kidney transplant came to me on August 21 last year. Uh, that was Eclipse Day, some of you might remember. I missed the eclipse because I was in surgery, so I didn't get any of that, but it was worth it missing the eclipse. So like I said, my story is sometimes challenging and maybe even sad, but over and over again full of the abundance of God's blessing and his answers to prayer. But today I'd rather not tell about my story. That's all you're going to get. Um, I could tell you more later. But I'd rather talk about your story. I'd like to talk about how you have a voice and not just those of us who have the privilege of standing here before you in this series. I want you to know today that there is inspiration, there is power for the kingdom of God in your story. Today, it's about your voice. So I want to start with a couple of illustrations that come from science. I told others that uh, I want to impress Jeff since he's from this background of science. So I want to make sure we put some science in this message today so that he'll know I know something. Um, so let's start with Sir Isaac Newton. You've heard of him, Sir Isaac Newton. Many of you don't realize, because he's well known for his scientific uh, contributions, don't realize that Sir Isaac Newton was a Christian who actually in his writings probably wrote nearly as much, maybe more, in the area of prophecy and Bible uh, study uh, than he did in the area of science, which he's so well known for. It's kind of a missing part of the story that's been lost, but it is true. He lived from 1642 to 1727, and around the age 42, you think about how young that is, age 42 in 1684, he published his well-known Laws of Motion. You've heard these. You may not remember all of them, but you've heard these. The first Law of Motion says, any moving body will continue to move in a straight line at a constant speed unless it is acted upon by an outside force. Now this is like marbles. You know, as a boy I played marbles and some of you might have played marbles. You know a little bit about that, right? So um, when you're playing marbles, you throw the marble and it will continue in a straight line unless it's moved upon by an outside force. Either some other marble hits it or uh, maybe you're playing on carpet and so the carpet uh, slows it down, outside force. So that's simply the first law of motion. Now here's what I'm trying to illustrate for you. How do we share our faith? How do we tell our story to others? So often we are kind of in this model of um, the laws of motion where we hope that we can interact with somebody and because of the interaction of our life, we somehow impact their life. So I'm gonna to skip to the third law of motion because it's more practical for the illustration. The third law says, and you know this one probably, for every action there is an equal and 
opposite reaction, right? So when you're playing marbles, that's when you throw your marble and the opponent's marble is sitting on the floor. And when your marble hits it, it transfers the energy from your marble to their marble and it goes flying in some other direction. Now, when we think about sharing our faith, that's really what we want to see happen, right? We want to see our interaction, our story, our teaching, our whatever we're doing. We want to see it interact with that other life and somehow create a new trajectory, somehow do something that will move them towards the kingdom of God and something will change in their life. And that's a great model for sharing our faith, I think. Um, it, it's oftentimes we think about doing this when we knock on a door and we share something with someone and we hope that that momentary experience, that one moment in time, will be like the marble striking another and create a new opportunity for God to work in their life. You hear stories about people who are on airplanes and they sit down with somebody and they spend the time talking on an airplane about how God is at work or some part of the story or they teach some Bible lesson to them in that moment. And people's lives really are changed. This really does happen. God creates these appointments where people have just a moment of time and they may never see the person again. And something that they say in telling their story or how God has worked for them or maybe a simple scripture that they share, some word of hope can really touch people and move them and change them. So when I talk about this method as one of the two that I'm gonna talk about, I don't want you to understand or take away that I don't think this is a good method. I think it really is a good method. God uses it and he uses it in very powerful ways. The challenge with this method is that what we've learned in the church over the years is that only about 10% of us in the church actually like that method. Um, only about 10% of us feel really good about sitting down in an airplane instead of reading our book talking to a stranger. Uh, only a few of us really are happy to go knock on doors and like it. Only about 10% of us have sort of the gift to be able to meet strangers and, and enjoy it and be able to just share something so personal, personal like your faith and your story with total strangers. It's a powerful method when you're the one who can do it, but what about the 90% who are yeah, kind of nervous with that one? And because we're a little nervous with it, we're not as inclined to do it unless we're really forced into it. And so what then happens to our story? What happens to the sharing of our faith? We may read the book instead of tell our story on the airplane. So I have another scientific model. We'll try this one. See if this fits a little better for you. So this is a, a mathematician named Archimedes. Have you heard of Archimedes? Archimedes was a Greek mathematician. He lived from 287 to 212 BC. Among his discoveries and what he wrote about were certain laws of hydrostatics. You can figure out that word. Hydrostatic means fluids at rest. So what's so amazing about fluids just sitting there, right? Not much, probably. But here's the story that we learn from Archimedes. During the time he was alive and where he was, there was a king who had asked a goldsmith to make him a crown. And he had given him a certain amount of gold to use in the making of the crown. But the king got nervous once the crown was made and he was looking at it. And he was kind of concerned that the, the goldsmith who had worked on the crown might have cheated the king. He was worried that maybe that goldsmith had pocketed some of the gold and mixed in some cheaper material, silver or something else, to hide within the crown, make it look good, but keep off some of the gold for himself. So the king was asking Archimedes to solve this problem. Can you tell me if this goldsmith used all the gold or did he cheat me and do something else? I need to know. Now, of course, Archimedes is faced with a serious problem because you cannot take the king's crown and start scraping it with a knife to see if it's real. You can't melt it down and separate the elements to see if it's all gold or something else. It's the king's crown, you have to leave it intact. You can't mess with it. So how do you know it looks gold? How do you know if it's really gold? 
So Archimedes was puzzled over this and he was considering it, wrestling with it, thinking, how do I solve this problem? And a strange thing happens, and you probably know how this works. Um, Archimedes was getting into his bathtub one day when all of a sudden the answer came to him. You know, your most genius moments come when you don't expect them, right? You're getting in the shower, all of a sudden, ah, oh, that's it. Um, that's what happened to Archimedes. He was getting into the bathtub when he noticed that as he lowered himself into the tub, water spilled out of the tub equal to the volume of his body. Now that may not seem all that genius, but here's how he figured it out. If you have a certain weight of gold, because gold is dense and it has a certain amount of volume in that weight, you can compare that weight of gold to that weight of silver and because the silver or some other material is not as dense as the gold, it will actually take up more volume. So for the known weight of the gold that was provided to the goldsmith, we know how much volume it should take up in its finished product. And so Archimedes was so excited, he had figured this out, he knew how to solve the problem. He got so excited, he jumped up from his bath, he ran out into the street naked, crying out in Greek, Eureka! Eureka, I have found it, I found it. You heard that story before? Maybe you didn't know the whole story. So let me show you how I believe this can help us understand how we share our faith. So especially for those of us that may not be quite as comfortable on an airplane meeting strangers. So let's see if we can make this work. I have a few cups here. I'm gonna put them together, these cups are the people in your life. And um, each of these is possibly a neighbor, a person you work with, a person who is um, maybe in your school, a person who you know well, a person who you spend time with. Now the top cup we're gonna put up here is you. And of course, this is Jesus, right? The water of life. Jesus is the one who comes into your life and he fills you up. He fills you up as you spend time with him. He fills you up when you read the word of God. He fills you up as you spend time in prayer. He fills you as you worship with one another like we are here this morning. Your life is filled. In spite of the challenges and the difficulties in your story, God's blessings fill your cup. And as you are filled, that filling begins eventually to spill over to the lives of others. Now you may not even try that hard. Your story is spilling over for good or bad. It depends on how you tell your story. It depends on how you spend time with others. Now it may not spill equally into the life of every other one around you. For some it's gonna spill a lot more, for some a little less. I told Vince that maybe this table was not level. But it works for the illustration. Because not everyone's equally ready to hear your story. Not everyone is, is a recipient equally of the grace of God, right? Not everyone is prepared for what God is gonna to speak to their heart through your story. However, the opportunity you have to tell the story, the opportunity you have, because every one of you has a story, about what God has already done in you. Every one of you, as your cup has been filled, has something to spill over as a testimony to the lives of others. And it doesn't mean you have to memorize a Bible study. It doesn't mean you have to have a list of Bible texts to prove something. What it means is that you know what God has done and your story is powerful and inspirational to others who are looking for hope, who are looking for something in Jesus, who are looking for answers and simply living your story in a way that people can hear it. And sometimes people say it doesn't need words, but trust me, people need the words to know what the story means, right? People need to know that this was Jesus who did this for you. This wasn't just an accident in life that you were blessed. This was God who did this for you. And so your voice matters very much, not just your life, but your voice. So I call this the water of life method. I call the first method the bump and run method. 
Both of them are effective, but I think this is much more available to most of us. But it raises a question, how do we spend time with the people who need to hear our voice? Who need our story to lift their life? So let's turn to the story that Jesus, um, where Jesus does this very thing. It's found in John chapter four, Gospel of John chapter four, where Jesus meets the well-known story, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. So let's look at this and we'll begin in verse seven very quickly. Verse seven through nine, um, start with that. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So there's a problem already, right? So Jesus is wanting to talk to her, enter into her life, somehow allow him to pour into her life. And yet she sees an obstacle. Now he knew the obstacle. He was not unaware of these rules. There were a lot of rules. He shouldn't be talking to a Samaritan to start with. He probably shouldn't be talking to a woman at the well. He probably shouldn't be asking a stranger to do this kind of thing. So here he is going to break the rules because he knows that she needs it, right? He knows that if I don't talk to her, she will go away as empty as she came. But he doesn't want her to go away empty. And so he speaks to her anyway. So I want to ask you to start with, who is your woman at the well? Who is the person who needs the story that's in you to empty into their life to help fill them who maybe is not easy to spend that time with? It's someone who maybe you have to cross some barriers to reach. Someone who might not live like you. Someone who may not talk like you. They may not eat like you. They may not drink like you. They may do things that you don't do. But who are they that you need to touch for Jesus? Jesus didn't let it hold him back. Jesus did it anyway. And I think he wants us to be willing to do the same, don't you? To go to the people who need him most. And so the story continues, because Jesus didn't hold back. So Jesus answered her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who is it that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now he's speaking of a metaphor now, right? The water is what he offers in hope and forgiveness and grace. Of course, she's not quite getting it. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself and also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's still trying to think about, you know, the practical water. She's still thinking about, I have to keep coming back here every day and carrying water back and forth. Yeah, if you have water that I don't have to keep coming back, okay, I'll take it. But she still didn't quite get what he was talking about, did she? She thought it, he was still talking about just water when he was talking about life. Now, it's interesting what he says to her, that if you receive the water I want to give you, it will become not just your water, it will become a spring of water in you. We'll come back to that in a moment because we'll see how that actually does happen in her life. So she's uh, not sure what's going on. So Jesus decides to do what really has to happen because sharing your faith, let's call it evangelism, is always gotta be personal. And so Jesus can't help her until he goes to the place of her life where she needs him most, right? She needs hope, she needs healing. Her life is in trouble, and we find this out from the next passage we read. So verse 16, he says to her, go call your husband and come back. He knew, right? 
I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is actually quite true. He knew this. So why did he say this? Because for Jesus to change a life, for Jesus to contact, come into contact with a life and send it in a new trajectory, it is not about what's on the surface. It's not about the casual things of our life. For Jesus to change us for his forgiveness and his hope to really matter to us, he has to go to the deepest places. He has to go to the places where we're broken the most, where we're hurting the most, where we are in the most trouble. And he knows what those are. He knows how it is. And here's where Jesus has a little advantage over us in what we're going to do because Jesus had the Savior's knowledge, right? Jesus said to this woman, I know your story. I know where your pain is. I know what hurts you. I know what makes you feel lost. And he names it for her. He says it. We may not be able to do that. We may not be able to speak into the painful places of people's lives because we may not know. And if we are going to help the grace of God enter and the forgiveness of God enter into those places in people's lives, the only way that we can help them do that is for us to spend time with them, to build trust with them, to earn the opportunity for them to be open with us so that we can tell them how God and his forgiveness can change all of that past. So what we have to do is different than Jesus. We can't have that moment where we have that insight and just come and speak into them. We have to invest time with them. We have to get close to them and love them. And sometimes it means being messy because people's lives are just messy, all of us. And we have to be there for them and love them over time. And if we do, they will learn to trust and they'll learn to share and we'll be able to allow the gospel that's in us to spill over and bring healing and hope and life transformation into their life. Somebody did that for you. And you can do that for someone else. Maybe many someone else's. So it's interesting because the story isn't really done you know, her answer, we won't read this passage for the sake of time, but her answer is she changes the subject. You know, people get a little uncomfortable. She just changes the subject. She says to him, so I understand that you people worship one way and our, my people worship another way. And what do you think about this debate? Is there a good way to worship? Now, I found it very interesting she does that because what I've experienced as a pastor over the years is that just as God is about to do his most powerful work in the life of a person, Sometimes when he's about to do his most powerful transforming work of grace in the life of a congregation, somebody comes along and changes the subject to something that they can argue about. That's what she tried to do. And you've heard of worship wars, right? That's not the only thing people argue about, but it's one of the things that works pretty well. So we start arguing and we miss the whole point. We get distracted from what Jesus is trying to do, what the Holy Spirit is trying to bring about, and we go off on a tangent and nothing happens. So thankfully, Jesus does not bite on that. He does not get caught up in that argument. He gives her an answer, but it's not what she's looking for. He simply says, look, it's not about that. It's about worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's the real heart answer, isn't it? But he doesn't go down the road of debating all the parts. He's more interested in changing her life. So then we hear this part of the story in verse 28 and 29. When leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She saw in Jesus, not only someone who knew her, but who accepted her anyway, who gave her grace, gave her hope, and was willing to give her the water of life to change her, to never have to come back again. And we know that her life made a difference and that her story was powerful as a spring of water overflowing into those others because in verse 39 we're told that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him 
because of the woman's testimony. What kind of testimony could she have in such a short time? This was her testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Jesus knows everything you ever did, and he loves you. And he's there for you, and he blesses you. That's your story. It's not complex. Jesus knows everything you ever did, and he still loved you. Her story changed the lives of many others simply from that. So we have to remember that evangelism is always personal. Evangelism is not about a list of things to learn. It's about, not about intellectual stuff. Evangelism is about life. Jesus always goes to the place where life is happening and brings his healing touch. Now, Jesus understands what this is and what he wants from us. He told his disciples before he left in this well-known gospel commission, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I like to remind people that this was not a command to go baptize. It's not what it says. It was not a command to go teach, though these are the part of the process that occurs as you do it. The command was very clear. And by the way, the original language is imperative. Go, it's not just a question, would you consider? It is a command to go, to do what? To disciple. So what does disciple look like? Well, Jesus taught us that pretty well because Jesus didn't just come and preach and teach. Jesus had disciples who basically what that looks like is they spent time with him. They walked with him. They followed him around. And by walking with him day by day, they got to see his heart. They got to see his work. They came to understand who the Savior really was. You're a disciple because you walk with him. And how do others who are around you learn to walk with him too? Maybe by walking with you as you walk with him. So it really comes down to how much time we spend with people, how well we love them. How do we get past the messiness of their lives and enter into where they live? Because evangelism is always personal. So this is why we can't wait for a handful of pastors and a few elders in the church, maybe a few leaders to to do all that needs to be done. Just think about the opportunity that we have as we interconnect in relationships with all of the people around us. You know, we just put one cup spilling into a few others here. But think if this cup who is being filled by Jesus represented this congregation and we didn't have maybe 500 or 1,000, but this congregation is over 3,000 people who attend here and watch online and are a part of this congregation. These are the people I love, right? So what if each of us had that kind of an impact in the many, many lives who are around us? Think of the the power of that for the kingdom of God that happens within the community around us. I know that for you, many of you, it is already true. For some, you're struggling with how it would look and how can I really invest in the life of someone else. But it's powerful because Jesus had 12 and he changed the world. And we have so much more. Your circle of influence for Jesus will never be my circle. My circle will never be yours. But we all have these wide circles together. The story is told that recounts the return of Jesus to heaven after he was spending his time here on earth. And the story is that he spent time talking to Gabriel and Gabriel was asking him questions about his time here. And he looked at the marks on Jesus' hands and and the marks of the crucifixion and all that Jesus had done in his death for us. And the angel Gabriel approached him and he says, Master, you must have suffered terribly for for men and women when you were there on earth. Jesus says, of course I did. And then Gabriel continues and asks, do they know, do they really understand how very much you've done for them? And Jesus says, not really, not right now, not yet. 
For right now, only a handful of people in Palestine know my story. Gabriel was a little troubled, and he asked, so what have you done then, Jesus, to let everyone know so that everyone can know your story and what you have done for them and how much you really have loved them? And Jesus said, well, I've asked Peter and James, John, a few more of my friends to tell people about me. And those who are told will tell a few other people about me. And my story will eventually be spread into the farthest reaches of the globe. And ultimately, all of mankind will have heard about my life, my death, and what I have done for them and how very deeply I have loved them. And Gabriel was a little concerned. He kind of frowned a little bit and had a little bit of skepticism because Gabriel knew very well how unreliable human nature is. And so he thinks and he says to Jesus, so um, what if Peter and James and John grow weary and tired and don't do it? What if people who come after them just forget? What if way down in the 21st century, people just don't tell anybody about you anymore? Have you another plan? And Jesus said, I haven't made any other plans. I am counting on them. And 20 centuries later, he still has no other plan. He's counting on you and me, simply to tell the story of what Jesus has done for us. He loves you. He loves all the people around you. And when Jesus says, these are the people I love, he's talking about you, all of us. But Jesus is not just talking when he says, these are the people I love, he's just not talking about the people in this room. Jesus is talking about the people out here. He's, he's talking about the people who you work with and the people who are in your neighborhood, the people in your school, the people who don't eat like you and who don't talk like you and don't live like you, the people who don't really know him yet, Jesus says, these are the people I love. And I want the people who love me to love them too. And tell them how much I love them. So he loves the people all around us. And people drive by on this 436 all afternoon today all morning today. And so many of them, they might have heard of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. And they don't know what we know. They don't have the privilege we have of his blessings in their life. And, and yet Jesus loves them with an everlasting love. And he wants to fill you with a wa water that is a spring of water to overflow into their lives so they can also be filled and spilled to the lives of those around them. That's how it works. So Jesus' early disciples, they accepted his priorities. They devoted themselves to reaching their world one at a time and they turned their world upside down. And Jesus was right to count on them. And I believe that he's right about us today as well. What about you?